Hello, and welcome to GC360, where news comes full circle. I'm Deanna Hamilton. And I'm Michael Warwick. Coming up on GC360, we dive deeper into the turmoil that is causing a split in our city government. And for some, the road to fame and glory on the sports field starts right here in Milledgeville. Georgia Military College has the recipe for success. Then we find out the story behind the beanies that are taking GC's campus one beanie at a time. The execution of Kelly Renee Gissendainer has been postponed for a second time, and organizers of an online petition to secure clemency for the convicted murder say they have more than 83,000 signatures. Supporters say she has found religion and turned her life around, and embraced education in prison. Gissendainer would be the first woman executed in Georgia since 1945. She had been scheduled to die by lethal injection on Monday, March 2nd, but corrections officials postponed the ex execution because the drugs to be used appeared cloudy. She was convicted of arranging the murder of her husband by her boyfriend in 1997. A new execution date has not yet been set. Turning to the turmoil in the Milledgeville city government, the union recorder reports that citizens probably won't have a chance this summer to vote on whether the city and county government should unify. A bill in the Georgia House to bring a vote looks like it will die in committee and not be enacted. Controversy over the unification issue set off a chain of events that led to charges of ethics violations. And that's a thread that GC360 Heidi Burrows picks up. Last week, we gave you an overview of the controversy Milledgeville city government has been experiencing recently. From the mayor stepping down to governments merging to ethics violations, the community as a whole has been in a state of chaos. This week, GC360 is taking a more in-depth look at the recent rulings by Special Master Patrick Longin on the ethical violations committed by Milledgeville's government. Who committed them? What were the consequences? How has the community been affected? After a month-long hearing, Longin ruled that City Manager Barry Jarrett was guilty of irresponsibly handling $5.1 million of public money. Melba Burell, who along with others originally brought the ethics complaints forward, explains the ruling. The city refused to do that. They still have refused to do that. So I would think if they really want to work to uh, improve government and to improve their relationship with the community, that they would, would deny and say, we'll never do this again. It is not what we believe is a, a good policy. Um, and they have not done that yet. Longin found that Jarrett was in violation of the city's code of ethics by making use of public funds for a purpose other than the general welfare of the people. Jarrett has until March 18th to appeal the special master's ruling. If he appeals, the case can be taken to the district court. Additionally, four council members, Walden, Mullins, Shinholster, and Lee, were criticized for signing off on a letter in favor of moving the city's money, essentially supporting retaliation. Four council members were not found guilty of any wrongdoing, as they did not personally handle any of the city's money. Jarrett and the council members were either unavailable or declined to comment on the matter. A separate complaint was brought against Walter Reynolds, who recorded the conversation, but the special master did not rule this as an ethical violation. Last Tuesday's city council meeting discussed the rulings. No actions have been taken yet against Jarrett or the city council members who were in favor of moving the money. The city's government remains in a state of uncertainty regarding the fate of Barry Jarrett and the government as a whole. Next week, GC360 will be taking a closer look at the efforts of the city council to stifle the public's discussion of this issue, and if a poisonous snake appearing in a citizen's car could be related. Stay tuned and talk to us online if you have any information that might be helpful in our reporting. For GC360, I'm Heidi Barras. When faced with the threat of violence, would you be prepared to defend yourself? Reporter Jesper Hagel takes a look at how GC is helping others to prepare for such a scary instance. In Georgia College, new workshop against sexual assault, it all boils down to one thing. Where? 
do we draw the line? Yeah. Yeah. So according to George Cross, yeah. yeah. uh, wow. anything with jokes. Pretty. Like, yeah. Should we just say all rape is? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah this so is all this the same. Is, is that how? Is that how you all feel the Georgia College community feels about it? Yeah. yeah. No. no. The workshop, which is a part of a bigger program called Project Brave, aims to make students and faculty members recognize dangerous situations so they can be able to intervene. So bystander intervention training is basically providing um, students, staff, faculty with the tools uh, that they need to step in on potentially risky situations uh, if they see something that might lead to a sexual assault or a dating domestic violence situation um, or stalking situation. Project Brave got real in 2013 when the Georgia College Women's Center received a grant worth $300,000 However, this is the first semester when GC students actually receive training. The workshops are being held at the last Friday every month throughout the semester. I have friends back home that have been victims of sexual assault, yes, but not here on campus. How common do you think it is? I think it's a lot more common than we think it is. As far as percentages go, I don't know the numbers, but I think it's it looks different to everybody, so I think it's a lot more common than most people would assume it is. Sadly, Jack Elliot Gower is right. Sexual assault at Georgia College is far more common than people might think. According to the Women's Center, almost one out of every four female students will have been a victim of some sort of sexual assault, including rape, before graduation. We see a lot of students who uh, to the use of alcohol to facilitate sexual assault um, and so that would be that but I mean it's important to recognize that uh, the large majority of these assaults are committed by somebody that a student might know or a person might know um, they're not the stranger danger kind of uh, myth that's perpetuated I think the biggest way is just intervening in anything that looks suspicious or not right. Um, I think it's really easy for people just to walk away from a situation, and if you're not directly involved in it, then it's not your problem. You don't have to worry about it. But I think truly, if you see something that doesn't look right, even just stepping in and asking questions is one way to prevent it. Thanks, Jesper. After the break, we're going to get to know one of our Georgia College athletes, a very accomplished golfer. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. I think someone at my friend's school has this thing called autism. My friend's brother's son has autism. My neighbor's son has autism. My son has autism. Autism is getting closer to home. Today, one in 68 children is diagnosed with autism. That's about a 30% increase in two years. Learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. What if you could invest in the future? The future of kids, like a stock. Not the kind of stock that's about making money, but a stock for social change. A whole new kind of investment called Better Futures. When you invest, it helps kids go to college. Believe in us, invest in us, watch us grow. My name is Sydney, and I'm your dividend.
Welcome to GC360 Sports. I'm Cole Rogers. I'm Kelly Miller. And I'm KJ Sinclair. As we move closer to spring, a number of Georgia College sports teams are thriving in the national rankings. Both the men's and women's tennis teams are nationally ranked and hosted Valdosta State on Tuesday. The 20th ranked Bobcat men were defeated as they took on the 10th ranked Blazers, despite a heroic effort from freshman Pedro Esonaro, who notched two of the team's three wins, the Bobcats fell short, losing the contest five matches to three. In the women's match, despite a rain delay, the 26th ranked Bobcat women were also looking for a win as they faced the 11th ranked team in the nation. And they would do so in an excellent fashion, sweeping VSU five matches to none. Emma Niyami seal the win in the final match and improves her singles record to a team high, 5-1. and one. Both teams are back in action on Saturday as they travel to Young Harris College. The buzz around campus has been on the softball team. Ranked 15th in the nation and winners of eight games in a row, the Bobcat women are off to an excellent start. Led by the terrific pitching duo of Melissa Boyette and Carly Lewis, the Bobcats have a 17 and 3 record. Boyette has tallied 77 strikeouts on the year and has an undefeated record of 10 and 0. Freshman slugger Holland Corsi leads the team with a 417 batting average, and junior catcher Lacey Najafi leads the team with four home runs. On a different diamond, the baseball season is also underway. The team took to the field to play host to North Greenville. In an evenly matched game, with each team getting 10 hits, the Bobcats were able to get the 7-3 victory. Freshman pitcher Charlie Hecht was strong on the mound throughout, going six innings and allowing just two earned runs on six of the hits before being relieved. The freshman got his first win of the season, while the Bobcats improved to 5-9. Georgia Military College is also known for their junior college athletic programs. GC360 reporter Carly Spear gives us a first-hand look at how important the program can be for some players. Sometimes outstanding athletes are unable to make it to a Division I program right after high school, so they go to a two-year college instead, improve their grades if they can, and move to a bigger school. Georgia Military College is one of those two-year schools. GMC has a JUCO or junior college program. Burt Williams is GMC's head football coach. The softball team uh, first came uh, in 2004-2005 in academic year, so 2005 would have been their first season. So they are entering their 11th season playing uh, in the junior college uh, sports conference here in Georgia, the Georgia Collegiate Athletic Association. So GMC has softball as one of their teams in the JUCO program, but what other sports are there? Um, currently, we have football, um, which started in 91. We have uh, women's soccer, which started in 2001. We have men's soccer that started I believe it was 2003, and the, the two soccer teams, softball and football, are our four scholarship programs. GMC implemented the JUCO program to generate enrollment for the institution. One in six students are athletes at the college. They, they all have different goals, you know. It's, uh, it, it, there's not one simple stamp, and sometimes it's a little more defined uh, by the program. But uh, in general, uh, they all enjoy playing that sport in high school. They obviously had uh, some degree of competence or we would not have recruited them in. Out of all the teams, football has provided the most athletes with the ability to move forward with their athletic careers. Since 1991, 457 players have continued to play football after these years at GMC. Some players have gone on to compete at Division I schools like Georgia, Tennessee, and Clemson. Others went as far as the NFL. GMC's recruiting is elaborate. We do. We do the same process that four-year schools do. Uh, you know, we, uh, we evaluate film online. You know, we take uh, recommendations from four-year schools, you know, as they're out recruiting. Uh, we call the coaches that we know. You know, we each have a geographic area that we cover. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we pull in the film so we can start evaluating them against each other and ranking who's the best and uh, just trying to get the, the best ones we can to come be a part of what we're doing. From the looks of things, GMC is training their athletes well and preparing them for future success. I'm Carly Spear reporting for GC360. We're going to turn back to Georgia College Sports now, and specifically to golf. We have a special guest, Harrison Stewart, one of Georgia Col College's great golf players. Welcome, Harrison. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, Harrison, where were you born, and how did you start getting into golf? Well, I was born in Roswell, Georgia. Uh, I've actually been playing golf my whole life. My dad was a 
big college golfer and ever since I was little he had me swinging clubs and it kind of just went on from there I was able to I was fortunate enough to have a country club in my neighborhood I was able to go out and play and have fun with my buddies and that's kind of how I got into the game that's awesome that's good to hear um, what is what are some of your favorite accomplishments what when you look back at the golfing that you've done what's what's really stands out to you uh, well my favorite moment has got to be my hole in one last year we were qualifying at Harbor Club and it was getting dark and all six of us joined on the last hole and I was able to hit a drive and we couldn't really see it but our assistant coach was up there and he was screaming he saw it go in and that was a that was a pretty cool moment and one last question what do you plan to do after Georgia College with uh, well I'd like to become a professional golfer my my dream is one day win the Masters so I got the next two years here to get as good as I can awesome thank you Thank you. That's the sports scene for this week, but we have a lot more in store for you. We'll tell you all about the Knit Beanies taking campus one melon at a time. They said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. that a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. always wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Homemade noodles. Oh. Marty, stop it. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. It reminds me, I've been thinking uh, maybe we should try a new form of birth control. I heard about this one, it's called the IUD, intrauterine device. Or we could try the patch on your arm. Actually, I think that one goes in your butt. Bedsider.org has birth control information and a lot more. And it's... What do you think? Then? Arm of the butt. Thank you, dear. Well, you're very supple. It's like I was at your age. Back then, I was a sex expert. Used to call me the buttered biscuit. I know about birth control, too. So, you can ask me anything, baby. Bedsider.org has birth control information and a lot more. And it's... Have you had sex in this car yet? Authorities are reportedly investigating a Milledgeville dentist concerning a claim that he took money from a patient whose procedure he never finished. The Union Recorder quotes the county sheriff's office as, identi as identifying the dentist as Dr. Roy Lehrman. There is no answer on his home nor office phones, and no one appears to be at his office, but his website remains up. Multiple news reports say that this is not the dentist's first run-in with the law, as Lehrman was arrested in 2014 on charges of theft involving the alleged diversion of more than half a million dollars that belonged to his elderly mother. Police are seeking help in locating Lehrman. Their tip line is 478 414-4413. Love Your Melon is a company that strives to help those in need, and now it's come to campus through the work of GC students. GC 360's Sarah Beck gives us an inside look. Love Your Melon is changing the world one beanie at a time. And now, the company that gives beanies and hats to children with cancer for everyone you buy is a campus organization. It started at Georgia College almost by accident. <laughs> Basically, I was shopping for a new beanie, and because everyone was at a warm mind too much, so I went online and just looked at them, and I um, stumbled upon Love Your Melon's website, and it just like was for a great cause, and so then they had this link that was for campus ambassadors, and I just contacted the head guy, and he just got back to me really quickly about how to get involved. Love Your Melon was founded by two friends from Minnesota who had the idea of helping children with cancer by giving them colorful beanies. 
It's a nonprofit. It turns out helping us cross So they're about $30. Um, they're really nice. They are. Yeah, they're really perfect. good quality. They're really warm. And then <clears throat> shirts range from $30 to $40. GC's Love Your Melon organization is trying to expand its reach. Um, we are mainly trying to get the word spread a little more and try and get up some of our sales because we have to get 100 credits in order to officially be the campus team. One of the main events these students are looking forward to is Dance Marathon, which coincides with Love Your Melon's effort to help sick children. Students have already begun planning and have a lot in store for the upcoming semester. This is Sarah Beck reporting for GC360. Coming up after the break, <laughs> oh boy, Romeo, Romeo, for where art thou Romeo? Turns out he and Juliet are right here at Georgia College. Stay with us. Wow, these are really good. You act surprised. Mm. Practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection, they need you. If you want to be a parent, it doesn't matter how you play, what you wear, how you dance, or even what direction life takes you. You just need to be there. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care don't need perfection. They just need you. Can you help me with this? My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. Hmm. Sure. He helps me with homework. That would be 3.6795. Thanks. Yep. He helps me with my decision making. I wouldn't use this one. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. I'm learning so much. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Welcome to GC 360 Entertainment. I'm Veronica Ulysny. We begin with the latest production from the Georgia College Theater Department and a new twist on a timeless play. GC's 360 Kelsey Gower got the inside scoop from some of the cast and crew of Romeo and Juliet. Gone are the Shakespearean Romeo and Juliet. The Georgia College Theater Department has introduced a new modern celestial punk redemption of a classic Shakespeare play. Instead of men in tights and women in corsets, this Romeo and Juliet includes leather jackets and lacy white dresses. Lissa Hoganson, the director of the performance, decided to choose this approach because it spiced things up. The design kind of concepts make it different. The designers all rallied around this term of celestial punk. So it's, it's very young feeling. Um, it's, it's really, really fun. I think it's really cool. It's definitely, definitely really cool. With changes in the story comes additional challenges to the role. Uh, the hardest part would be having to put myself back into that place of being a 17-year-old that can be basically killed by everything that happens to him. Mm -hmm. She switches emotions quite a bit. Um, there's one scene where she goes from being happy to at the end being like completely like just so sad. And it, it's really challenging to, to go through that emotion all the way through it. A good way to get in touch with the drama and emotion of these characters is to complete many acting exercises to stretch their emotional capabilities. Hoganson described emotions as the turning of a faucet. Through these exercises, actors allow their true emotional feelings to pour out. As true with every performance, every actor has a favorite aspect of their character. It's a challenge to portray her and that makes it also like really cool when people come to see it and they're like, it's, it's she's so different from the typical Juliet. That's what I keep saying. Suppose one of the things I like about playing it is it's it's a play that or it's a role that I normally don't get to be in. I would say that lots of times I'm I'm never 
I'm never the lover. I'm never the guy that's always <laughs> like, I love this girl. I'm gonna chase her down. It's always. I feel like I get pinned as like the a hole a lot. <laughs> uh. Lissa Hogenson's revival of Romeo and Juliet successfully captures a newer, more unique approach. This performance ran from Thursday, February 26th to Saturday, February 28th. This is Kelsey Gower reporting for GC360. It's always an interesting night if you're a Georgia College SNAP driver. SNAPs are students looking to catch a ride after a late night of studying or partying. SNAP has seen it all. GC's 360's Alex Mason went out to catch a ride. 27, I'll 25 with you at the old courthouse in about three minutes. It's Thursday night. And that means Matt Laskowski and Josh Oshburn are starting their shifts as SNAP drivers. Ferrying students from downtown to the residencies can be an adventure. I had one guy tell me he lived at the dorms. He did not live anywhere near the dorms. He just wanted to go hang out at the dorms and just be sit at the reflection pool for some reason. GC360 was curious to see what being a SNAP driver is all about, so we hopped on for a ride. We started at the old courthouse and headed toward the dorms near Centennial Center after Matt Laskowski got a call from students there. Snap carts operate every evening, providing safe transportation for students. One of the most important jobs is to get them home after a night out at the downtown bars. Drivers like Laskowski, who's an accounting major, never know what might happen. Right when we first started, I was working this night, but I wasn't the one driving it. A girl came off Hancock and she turned on Irwin Street right here, headed to Grove Park, and uh, some guy yelled at another guy in the truck. And they went to Grove Park, got out, and this guy in the truck who was behind them came up behind them and apparently they didn't like each other and almost got in a fight and then an officer had to come up and settle it. SNAP, which stands for Student Night Auxiliary Patrol, prevent students from getting themselves into situations they might regret. I bet they save like 10 lives a year or something yeah. like that. Yeah, SNAP's definitely saved my life, helped me out a couple times, got me through some tough situations that I need to work through, got me to where I need to be whenever I need to be there, so go SNAP. We picked up these students at the dorms, turned around and went back downtown. After another call, it was back on the road. Destination, the Bellamy. These students seemed a little too excited to be jumping on a snap cart and heading downtown. Our final stop, back at the old courthouse. Definitely the best group of people I think I've worked with ever. Yeah, sure. no, no doubt. It's the best job I've ever had. Georgia college students love it. Snap drivers love it. And Snap got us where we wanted to go. I'm Alex Mason reporting for GC360. That's it for entertainment this week. Stay up to date with everything happening by checking out GC360's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube channel. See you next week. Now back to Michael and Deanna. Thanks, Veronica. That's a wrap for this week on GC360. We'll see you next Thursday at 4 p.m. In the meantime, catch us online at GC360news.com, on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. See you next week.